Remember a while back when Zach and I discussed audio data compression and what that does to your signal? Well, today we're going to talk about audio dynamic range compression and what that does to your signal. Here we go. Hello, Internet. Chris Klein here with Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. Happy 2022. We're going to kick off the year talking about dynamic range compression. And we're going to try to demystify some of what surrounds dynamic range compression as well. Mainly what it does to your signal, how different types or different flavors of compressors are going to react to signal, and some of the common uses and uncommon uses, and basically why you should just experiment with every compressor you ever get your hands on. So let's go ahead and dive into dynamic range compression. So dynamic range compression comes in two primary flavors. Upward dynamic range compression and downward dynamic range compression. Now, for the sake of this video, we're going to focus on downward dynamic range compression because that's what most of us are familiar with and that's how we most commonly use processors like this, whether they be uh, analog, physical, uh, rack units, or something that's in the box, a plug-in. Dynamic range compression, downward dynamic range range compression is going to take the transients of your signal and it's going to bring them down. It's basically like real-time automation, right, of your signal. So you have a bass guitar or a vocal and it's too hot at certain points, right? Well, you're going to have a threshold on your compressor that determines when it's going to kick in and it's going to bring that level back or the amplitude back a little bit for you. Or in some cases, maybe quite a bit. It just depends on what you're using. Now, the four main flavors of dynamic range compression are optical, which that's what this guy is right here, VCA, FET, and this is FET, not like Boba FET, a field effect transformer or transistor, excuse me, and then variable mu, which allows you to manipulate the tubes in your compressor. Now, once again, the two compressors that I have right here, these are uh, rack units, this is hardware, we have the warm WA2A, which is an optical compressor, and then the WA76, which is a FET compressor. We're going to talk about the other two as well, but I want to start with this one, the WA2A, because the optical compressor, at least for me, is one of the more unique types of compression and also tends to be a little more easy to use as well. So if you look here at our WA-2A, and this is a somewhat faithful recreation of the Teletronics LA-2A, you will see that it really only has two primary controls. You have your output gain or makeup gain, and then you have your gain reduction or peak reduction. Now this can also limit as well as compress, which changes the ratio. Now the cool thing about an optical compressor is the ratio is fixed. There's really a not, there really isn't a whole lot that you can do with it. The compression circuit itself is com almost completely program dependent. And the way it works is, again, I've said optical compressor, there is an, an opto cell in here. And what happens is as you feed signal into the box, there is a light. And that light is going to illuminate, uh, it's going to increase its illumination based off of how much signal or how strong the amplitude is that's coming into the box. As that light increases, it hits the optical cell, and then it's going to change the compression or give you more compression, right, as that light is illuminating with a, a greater intensity. It's a really, really fantastic circuit. It's really, really smooth. It doesn't have a real fast attack time, and the release time is based off of how long the compression circuit is actually engaged, how long you have peak reduction happening, or, how, or for how long you're actually bringing back that signal. Because of this, because of the smooth uh, attack time and release time, it lends itself to a very musical or pleasing type of effect. Now, if you give it too much with the peak, redu peak reduction knob, you will hear it kick in. Maybe you want that to happen, but most of the time, we want our compressor to be as transparent. And when I say transparent, I don't mean the, the audio circuit and how it sounds, but transparent and how it's pulling back the signal. We don't want our ears to hear it go whoo, which can create an effect called pumping and breathing. And all compressors can do that, right? But this right here 
Again, it's super musical, really, really easy to use, and it sounds fantastic on vocals, bass guitar, uh, string instruments, sometimes on overheads. And, and these are not hard rules or hard uses that I'm giving you right now. You need to experiment with every box that I'm gonna talk about to get an idea of how it's going to respond and react to different types of signal. So let's go ahead and listen to some examples that I created in my home studio using plugins. And you're gonna see the plugins that I've used and how they're responding to the signal. And we're also gonna show you all the settings so you can have an idea of what's happening. Now, again with this, only two settings or two, right? So let's go ahead and listen to optical compressors, but in the box. Stranger, but I get excited when you're that way. I seen your face a time or two. Every time it seems so new, but nothing else can be that. When we talk like this, you feel like a stranger, but I get excited when you're that way. I seen your face a time or two Every time it seems so new 
but nothing else can be that easy. So next I'm gonna talk about a VCA style compressor. Now right here I have a FET compressor. Uh, I don't have a VCA style compressor in here right now, but the thing that's nice is they share a lot of the same controls and features and flexibility. Uh, a VCA style compressor, and for those of you that are wondering, VCA stands for Voltage Controlled Amplifier or Voltage Controlled Attenuator. You can be a little bit more surgical with that type of compressor than you can with an optical. They sound very different, um, but again, uh, it's gonna be up to you to, to really dial in these sounds and, and experiment and, and figure out what's gonna work for you for certain applications. Now, with the optical compressor, once again, we only have our, our uh, output gain or our makeup gain in peak reduction or gain reduction. We're on a VCA style compressor. We're going to have the option to manipulate the threshold, the attack time. Now, let me explain what each of these parameters does real fast. The threshold is the point at which the compressor is gonna kick in. So if our audio goes over the threshold, compression happens, it brings it back. You have the attack time. The attack time is how long it's going to take for the compressor to react after the audio goes over the threshold. You have the release time. The release time is how long it's going to take for the compressor to return to full dynamic range after the audio signal goes below the threshold. And then you have the ratio. Now the ratio can be one to one, two to one, four to one, eight to one, 12. It depends on what type of compressor you have. 20 to one, 10 to one, which at that point you're basically limiting. And what this means is, let's use four to one as an example. And I'm not gonna get too into the math because when I taught this at university, I would watch my students' eyes roll into the backs of their skulls because they weren't interested. <laughs> but at four to one, if your audio goes four dB over the threshold, well, the output is gonna be one dB, four to one. Pretty simple, right? So the thing that's nice about these, once again, is you can get really, really surgical with a really, really fast attack time, where with this, you can't do that, right? It's fixed and it's program dependent. And every compressor is program dependent. But with these, our VCA and FET style, we can actually manipulate these parameters to dial in a sound or a compression uh, ratio uh, or feel that is gonna be more fitting to the type of music that you are recording or that you're mixing within. One of the most popular VCA compressors is the SSL G-Bus. It's a stereo compressor, and for a long time, you only could use that compressor if you were on a giant British inline SSL console that cost anywhere from $250,000 to $500,000, if not more. Warm actually has recreated this compressor. It's one rack unit, and the thing that's really, really cool about it is they incorporated a transformer, a Cinemag transformer into the path, which gives you a little more distortion coloration, not heavy, heavy distortion, but harmonic distortion, and a high pass filter. These things are not available on the SSL compressor. The high, piss, high pass fil filter, excuse me, is going to allow you, or it's going to allow the compressor to not respond to low end content. Just what's happening after the filter. So if you have something that's really, really kick drum heavy, it's not gonna sit there and pump and breathe to that kick drum. You might want that, but in some instances you don't. So once again, we're gonna jump into the box I'm gonna go ahead and play some examples for you so you can see what's happening with the parameters, what's happening to our audio signal. And we're going to not only use an SSL style compressor uh, in the box that was actually uh, uh, coded by UAD or Universal Audio, but we're gonna look at other, or listen to, and look at other VCA style compressors using different mono instruments as well. So let's go ahead and take a listen.
So next up is the FET compressor. Now, for those of you that have been in studios, you've probably seen this style of compressor quite a bit. Going all the way back to the late 60s, early 70s, I'm trying to remember when Yuri produced the first 1176. Now, this is the warm version, uh, the WA76, which is a really faithful clone of uh, a, a Teletronics or a Yuri 1176, except this one doesn't break the bank. Uh, FET stands for Field Effect Transistor. Now, the thing that differentiates this from the VCA style is that this tends to be a little more colored than the VCA. Now, anything that you pass your signal through is going to add additional color, but some pieces are more transparent than others, like the SSLG bus that we just talked about, pretty transparent. The 1176 or the WA76, not so much. And because of that, some engineers like to use this style of compressor on different instruments or on vocals because of the harmonic coloration that happens. It can cause the, the signal to stand out a little bit more, which compression can you know, push your signal out front a little bit more as well when we're talking about depth of field. But these FET, FET FET style compressors, again, add a little more color to the signal. And some engineers will pass signal through the compressor and not even have it compress just because of the way that it colors the signal. Now here's another thing about this compressor. Like the VCA, we can control many times the attack, the release, the ratio, the input, the output, the threshold. Now on this, the threshold is fixed and it's governed by how much input you feed into it, right? And depending on how much you feed into it, that's gonna give you more coloration because you're gonna be driving circuits a little more heavily. So you can really get a lot of cool sounds out of this. And if you're looking for something that's really, really super aggressive, like you're trying to get that weird <laughs> pumping and breathing sucked in room sound on your drums, FET style is gonna do that for you. A VCA can as well, but the FET, at least to my ears, especially 1176s or the WA76, can do it with greater efficacy. Like if you're really trying to get that weird pumping and breathing effect, this is the way to go. But again, as I've stated with the other compressors, it's up to you to pass signal through here. What do vocals sound like? What does a guitar sound like? What do congas sound like? What happens if I put this in front of this because a vocal or whatever my signal is is too radical and it has too much dynamic range or, or the transients are too fast? Well, this can grab those really fast transients and this can give you that real musical compression that you're looking for. So there's all kinds of things you can do. And once again, we're gonna do it in the box. So we're gonna to listen to different FET style compressors across different types of instruments. And I'm actually gonna run a couple of vocal passes through one of these and one of these, a FET and an optical compressor in the box using universal audio plugins. And once again, I'll give you the parameters down below as well, even though you can see it on the screen. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Talk like this, you feel like a stranger But I get excited when you're that way I've seen your face a time or two Every time it seems so new But nothing else can be that easy When we talk like this, you feel like a stranger But I get excited when you're that way I seen your face a time or two Every time it seems so new But nothing else can be that easy When we talk like this You feel like a stranger But I get excited when you're that way I seen your face a time or two 
Every time it seems so new, but nothing else can be that easy. And as we come to the end of our journey, we're gonna talk about the variable mu compressor. Now, for many, this is the holy grail compressor. And I should probably be a little more specific. The holy grail variable mu compressor is the Fairchild 670. Now, approximately 1,000 were made. Uh, I don't know how many are in existence today. I've been very fortunate in that I have had my hands on about five or six. If you can find one, uh, be ready to shell out thirty to forty thousand dollars for one unit. They weigh about sixty to sixty-five pounds, and they have. I'm going to probably butcher this um, this information, but twenty tubes and fourteen or sixteen transformers in them. These things are beasts. Now the modern. VariMu today is made by Manly. It's uh, called the Manly Variable Mu. And that comes in two different flavors. You can get the standard or you can get the mastering compressor, which allows you to go into MS mode, which the Fairchild also does. Uh, the MS mode or mid side allows you to compress the mid signal, right? Or the, the center of your stereo image and the sides independently, which is really, really handy in mastering, especially when you're cutting to vinyl. Uh, Back in the day, and even today, a lot of cutting engineers will have a Manly Varimu or a Fairchild right in front of the lathe so they can manipulate or compress those, that program material independently. Uh, again, tubes, uh, transformers, lots of warmth, lots of color, which might be contradictory to what I had said earlier about VCA compressors being good for your stereo mix, submixes, mastering, and they're not very colored but the coloration that you're gonna get from a very mu from the tubes and the transformers is going to be desirable for many. And one of the primary reasons, is for, the primary reasons for that is because so many of us are familiar with that sound. We understand, even though we don't, some of us don't know what these pieces are, there's a familiarity, a, a welcoming to that compression, to that tone, right? And once again, a lot of these Compressors have been uh, tweaked in the box where they have turned every component into an algorithm so that you can try to get the most accurate representation of a thirty or forty thousand dollar compressor in your system. For those of you that have been watching Get Back on Disney, when you look at 
the studios that they're in, primarily uh, Twickenham and uh, Apple Cores or the Apple Studio, you'll see mono channels of that Fairchild compressor. Uh, at the time, when they were first created, uh, Abbey Road bought something like 16 of them, uh, mono and stereo, if I'm not mistaken. So they're out there, but they're really expensive. The cool thing is we have them in the box, they sound really good, and you can use it more than once. So just imagine if you wanted to have a couple of Fairchild 670s in your session, well, now you're out $80,000. Or even with the Manly Vary Mew, I think the Vary, the Vary Mew, the, the non-mastering edition, is right around $5,000 now. So if you have two of those in your studio, and if you do, you're incredibly lucky, you're out $10,000. Well, that exists in Universal's lineup of plugins as well. So once again, and for the last time, maybe not the last time ever, we're going to listen to these compressors across different types of material, stereo, subgroups, individual instruments, and get an idea of how they sound, feel, how they react. Let's listen to them. So I certainly hope that everybody that's listening today or th all throughout time is getting something out of this little primer on compressors. I'm going to stress it again. I've been saying it as we've moved across the four different types. Experiment, experiment, experiment. Take every type of signal you can think of, vocal, synthesizers, drum machines, whatever, maracas, triangles, put them through different types of compressors, especially if you're working in the box. If you have any DAW that's available on the market today, it's going to have all kinds of compression plugins that are already bundled with it. Just experiment and get an idea for how these things feel. Also remember that the hardware does exist. It's going to take up space. It's considerably more expensive than having plugins. But is there a difference in the sound? Yes, absolutely. Is it going to, is it going to hinder your process or is it going to change the overall feel or sound of your mix? That's negligible. I use a lot in the box, tons, but I also use stuff out here in the physical real world too because I have been collecting gear for a long time and because 
there's certain pieces that I have that I know how they sound and they don't sound like anything else. And I want to incorporate that into my mix. But I have been in other studios where I don't have my pieces and I use the plug-in emulations and I'm always pleased, especially if it's universal audio or when we start talking about effects, sound toys, and some other more boutique plug-in organizations or companies that, that uh, exist today. So let's continue this conversation and dialogue about compression and how it can benefit us, different tricks that we discover. Let's get stuff happening down in the comments. Let's see more comments. Let's get more dialogue happening. Let's have a healthy conversation on how all these pieces are gonna work in all of our productions, whether we're talking about this, or all the beautiful synthesizers that Zach is discussing, or the guitars that Chris and Cooper are talking about. Let's, let's have more of a dialogue happening because all these things are gonna benefit us in some way. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. We also have a piano channel, and we have the guitar channel. Let's subscribe to those. And uh, I think that's it for today. Oh, and our, we have an accordion channel, right? Because we're, we're in Central Texas, and accordions are so awesome, and we should be loving them and squeezing them and hugging them more. So let's get some action over there, too, because I know that whenever I've recorded accordions, I'm using compressors to help the dynamic range. So all these discussions can come around full circle, no matter what we're talking about. Even if we're just working in the box with electronic music, all this stuff is applicable. Cool? So if you haven't subscribed, once again, we have all these other channels. Subscribe. Let's continue doing this. Let's have an amazing, wonderful 2022. Let's be good to each other. Let's create. Even if we're locked up some more, it's a prime time to be creating content. And uh, let's do this again. Once again, Alma Music Center in San Antonio. I'm Chris Klein, and I will see you again probably in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.